Hello and welcome to the RAS Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Alex, how you doing, mate? Good, mate. Yeah, pretty good. How about yourself? Pretty good, pretty good. We're talking private schooling, government schooling or public. We're talking about is it worth it uh, in today's episode. So um, you no doubt have a lot of exposure to this through financial planning, particularly with your core uh, client base, which is you know, 20s, 30s, 40s and up. Um, how often do you come across education costs as a key goal, financial goal in a client's life? Yeah, it is um, <clears throat> it's definitely a, a, a talking point, um, generally always, right? So when, when people have got, have got young kids, and it's one of the questions that we typically ask as well when someone comes to see us for the first time, if they've got young kids or they're planning on having kids shortly, if that's part of their, their overall plan, um, asking them like, you know, is, is private school something that you'd like to consider in the future? Because, you know, with all things, um, when it comes mm -hmm. to investing, generally, the earlier you start, the easier it is. Yeah, absolutely. I often think that there's three big costs in people's lives that they need to get right. One is their home or living expenses, then there's the education and there's the transportation. Um, those are the three things. If people can figure out creative or you know well-planned ways to do that, I feel like that puts them on a really, really strong footing. Uh, and we've talked about in the past about the cost of cars and that's maybe something we can bring up in, uh, I think we've got a Q&A episode um, that we are going to tackle that one in. But um, let's try and keep it to education costs today. And we know that there's going to be some kind of like, I guess, value signaling here or like somewhere like we would spend money. So we're going to try and bring some data as well as some literature to this conversation and answer it from a financial perspective. But obviously, it is a personal decision that parents and grandparents and whatever will make. Um, there was an interesting stat that I found before recording, which is that some research says that 30 to 40% of um, kids in Australia attend a private school. I didn't know it was that high. It's 30% for uh, primary school and 40% for secondary. Um, and one of the overarching reasons, and this is based on literature, is that parents believe it will bring them success in life, however they define success in life. So uh, we can dive more into the actual study and, and research around whether or not that actually, it actually works, quote unquote. I'm curious though, mate, did you go private, public, Catholic? Uh, I, was, I was private uh, myself. Um, <clears throat> however, and obviously, state by state, it kind of varies a little bit like what you define as private. Um, I think we, we were chatting offline before that uh, in Victoria, you've kind of got private and Catholic and public, whereas um, over here in Western Australia, we do have a, a, the same sort of setup, but generally Catholic and private are sort of lumped lumped together. So yeah, I went, I went private myself. Um, however, it was sort of more of like a, a mid, mid-tier mid kind of private school is probably what you would consider it over here. So it wasn't sort of, yeah, one of the... Um, the upper uh, sort of echelon ones um, over here. Well, yeah, I went to a Catholic primary school and a Catholic boys secondary school and definitely no regrets from me. Um, and I was looking up the price of the school um, just before this and it's now up to around about $6,500 per year. Uh, it's a secondary and I was comparing that to some of the other private schools in Melbourne. Some of those can get up to 40,000, 45,000, 36,000. And the list is like Scotch College in Melbourne, for those of you that know, it's quite a well regarded school, it's 37,000 per year. There's a Scotch College over here in WA as well. Are they? Yeah. Oh, I've actually wondered whether they were there. Yeah. Huh. And it's also, it's also very highly regarded and very expensive too. Yeah. It's easy to see how if you've got, there are discounts um, for folks that don't know, there are discounts for uh, multiple children uh, and there's often discounts if you pay in advance or you lock uh, some money away in advance for it with the school uh, for obvious reasons. They're probably going to earn some interest on that, uh, that tuition paid in advance. But I think there's an important distinction here to make around like the actual true cost because a lot of people just see that number and they're like, oh, 40,000, that's not bad. I earn X, Y, Z. How do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, like you said, a lot of it comes down to, to a trade-off really um, because it, particularly if you are going for one of the more sort of well-known private schools, it is going to be a significant amount of money. Um, mm -hmm. And remember, 
when we're sort of throwing out these these figures today, it's always after tax as well, right? So if it's thirty grand a year to send your kid there, that's you know that's after tax too. So you know, in real terms, before tax, it might be like fifty grand or something like that. So it is it is definitely a, a mm. large commitment. Um, and like all things, you know, we can't plan for everything, but the earlier that you can plan, if this is a goal of yours to to send your kids to one of these schools, again, sort of the the easier it will be and the less sort of financial burden um, potentially as well. Yeah. So we'll try and um, bring some numbers to how you can, uh, if you are going down this path, how you can think about solving the problem of funding it. Um, there were some interesting things and I'm going to use, because I'm in, I'm in Melbourne, Alex is in Perth, but he has financial advisors right around the country. Uh, I'm going to bring some Victorian numbers and I can, the way it can, I can make this relevant to everyone is um, only 34% of parents uh, in this state think that they are financially equipped to deal or contribute with their education costs for their kids. In Victoria, we are the most expensive for government schools at around $6,000 a year on average. So that's 17% above the national average. So just assume five grand. That, that's interesting because, and I don't know this for a fact, by the way, but anecdotally, like you said, we deal with clients all around the country and I do have quite a lot of teaching clients in Victoria mm. and they do seem to be a little bit less paid than some of the other <laughs> states. <laughs> so yeah. that, that's, I don't know if that's true, but that's, and that's my own anecdotal <laughs> yeah, um, knowledge less, there. Um, <laughs> Charge yeah. more to the students, make mm. profit. Make profit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Victoria is also the second most expensive for private schooling. On average, it's seventeen thousand dollars a year. It's two percent above average. So just assume that an average private school around the country is around about seventeen thousand dollars in twenty twenty four, and we happen to be the most affordable for Catholic at ten thousand five hundred, which was that caught me off guard. So we do make the distinction in Victoria and in some eastern states that uh, there is this kind of middle ground, which is what I would probably call semi-private, which is Catholic or those types of the school, um, they do receive a considerable amount of government funding, um, but all of the school systems receive government funding. I think that's one of the kind of perceptions out there is that, you know, Catholics are the only ones who can know. Well, basically, private schools do too. It's just the funding mix is different. So they might offer those extra things like extra school hours, out of school hours, extracurricular activities. And a lot of that is going to though like the, the, a lot of the fees that you pay is going to that as well as to paying the teachers a bit more. Interesting on that as well. I found out the other day that yeah, so a lot of the the Catholic schools obviously receive subsidies from the Catholic Church and stuff like that if they obviously mm -hmm. adhere to a certain criteria. There are actually a couple of Catholic schools though that don't necessarily <laughs> adhere to that criteria as well, so they don't get as much funding. Um, so you'll find that those ones can be more expensive in that example as well. So. Yeah, it's obviously really important to do your own. Yeah, I never, I thought that if you were, you know, sort of black and white, but mm -hmm. apparently it's not. Interesting. Um, so the some folks, particularly I know a lot of folks in Perth, Alex, do this, um, but all around Australia, we're a pretty big country. So there's a lot of boarding that happens, people being sent away to boarding school. It's a pretty familiar story to a lot of people. Um, so depending on the school, the boarding can of, often be as much as the tuition. So yeah, so I'll use a real life example because you know, you and I did a little bit of research obviously before we started mm -hmm. this. So there's a school over here called Hale, um, which is an all boys school. Um, one of the more expensive schools that you can go to, I think it's around about 28 to 30 grand a year, <clears throat> excuse me, um, before, um, so just mm. the school fees. And then, yeah, you are correct. The, the boarding is $27,000. So it's basically wow. the same cost again. Wow. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, and that's the similar numbers to what I found, um, throughout Eastern States. Another thing that's quite interesting for a lot of people, parents will be familiar with this, but if you are planning on this, you may want to calculate this in things like school camps, things like getting an iPad or a MacBook for your kids to go to school. That's almost a necessity these days. In fact, in some schools it is, um, as well as textbooks and all the other things that come with just the standard tuition payment can add up to 5% of the actual tuition payment, depending on the school, maybe more, maybe less. Um, I know some schools, for example, when you go into high school, you do need an iPad or you do need um, some sort of laptop in order to do the curriculum. So that's another cost that you may have to bear if it's not provided by the school. So there's a lot of extra things that go around just the standard tuition, um, the standard you know, boarding, and then there's the extra things on top. Yeah, and sometimes like building levy, right, as well. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, you'll see that from time to time where the school is looking to expand. So um, you need to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a great business model it is. Yeah. We're just going to get everyone else to pay more for something that we're doing over here. Yeah, I remember anecdotally my old man, you know, 
stamp his feet and complaining because that was, you know, one of the costs um, that came in um, after I'd been at the school for a couple of years and, you know, yeah, obviously he paid it, but rightfully so. He's like, well, my son's only going to benefit from this because by the time this building is done, he's going to be gone. I'm uh, sort of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so a UNE study, a University of New England study found, and this is probably one of the most prominent academic uh, papers on the private school versus public school debate in Australia. The University of New England study found that there was no difference in academic performance once you adjust for the socioeconomic situation of the household. So what that means in simple terms is it, the household of the student is that, you know, can we control for the things like how much money the parents make, uh, how much, you know, the roof over the head kind of thing. Once we kind of minimize that, does the actual education have an outcome? Not necessarily. There was no material difference. And I can link to this in the, the show notes for anyone that wants to dive into the data. However, there was another study that came out from Curtin that suggests um, possibly a 10% average increase in hourly wage for people that went to a Catholic school and 15% for private school. And I'll quote the study, which says, overall, the results suggest that private schooling continues to be an important mechanism by which socioeconomic advantage is transmitted between Australian generations, largely due to enhanced access to higher education. So this, for those of you, let's translate that again. So this additional research, which suggests that yes, there is that kind of socioeconomic advantage for people that send them kids to private schools, typically because they're from a higher income household. Um, even like just factoring that in and just taking the raw data, no adjustments, they do tend to get higher ATAR scores, possibly five to six points higher. So like an 80 ATAR score might be an 85 or something like that. And so that does then affect university acceptance because obviously the universities have minimum rates to get in. And, and potentially getting into then, you know, like engineering or something like that, which then goes on to to pay a higher wage as a result of, of that occupation or that degree as well. Exactly. So what basically all of the data suggests is that if you control for all of those household factors, it doesn't seem that there's a meaningful difference, but those household impacts are real. So if you do have those uh, to your benefit, you're going to be advantaged, which makes sense. Um, but there's also some study that shows even if you get a top performing public school student and you take them to private school, there doesn't necessarily seem to be any impact on that student going to that private school, which is a very fascinating thing because you would think top performing student goes to a better school, quote unquote, should equal even better performance. But that's not necessarily what the data suggests is appropriate for everyone. So... I it's probably more like, like, sorry, I cut you okay, off there. No, it's it's probably more like around, like you said, like an average student can potentially become a little bit better at a private school. And again, anecdotally, I would probably link that back to the fact that a private school, right, how they make their money is through tuition fees largely. So mm -hmm. they want to have, you know, so they need to have a good resume. So if parents are considering this private school over this private school, if this one's got, you know, a better history of good ATAR results, which is a, obviously a standardized mm. test across, you know, across the country. So it is a good sort of benchmark per se. Then yeah, potentially as the parent, you're going to be like, well, that, that school, obviously, you know, they're doing something better than this yeah. school. So I'll send them there. Um, whereas like at a public school, whilst obviously, you know, the teachers will, will push students and everything, and I'm certainly not saying that, but there's less of that financial incentive, right, to, to score as well, um, because mm. The school's kind of getting the money regardless. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's why you do see some of the uh, teachers also pushing to go to those private schools, right? Because they, there may be incentives for them to push the students in a certain respect, um, as well as you have oftentimes like different types of school or music type uh, situations where those are maybe considered extracurricular at a public school, but at a private school. Not necessarily the case. There's a good example, though, uh, in Melbourne, in the, the town of Wangaratta. Sorry, this is not Melbourne. This is Victoria. It's a regional town. And they have multiple high schools. And their high, one of their high schools, which is a government school, is re really highly renowned for music. And so it's not necessarily to say that you only have to go to private school to get those. It's just that you may not be in the catchment areas 
for the public school that you want to send your kids to. And so that's probably an interesting thing from a financial planning perspective, Alex, which is, do you often get clients that come through to you and your team thinking that they will move just to get to a public school? Do you ever see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see that all the time. Um, uh, you know, recently I've had I've had two two um, groups of clients that I've worked with. Um, one was was sending their wanted to send their kids to one of the more expensive schools, so we're talking sort of twenty five thirty grand a year a um, kid. Mm -hmm. And the other ones who went to public school themselves, um, two pretty smart cookies to be honest. So probably to that example before, it wouldn't have mattered whether they're in public or private. They're they're, they're pretty mm -hmm. smart and they've gone on to do pretty good things. Um, but they just they just sort of felt more strongly about a public school, but they wanted a very good public school. So they actually, um, well, we worked on um, a bit of financial plan with them to effectively get them to yeah that that suburb where they get that catchment of that that really decent public school. Yeah, I was chatting to some family the other day, and they're thinking. So there's a, there's this interesting data which I uh, came across, which suggests that if you're in a suburb which has one of these good public schools that suburb's property prices will rise faster than the suburbs around them. And it makes sense because parents are looking to move into those suburbs and they're typically dual income households that are pursuing that. So they're able to spend more on the properties. So it's a really interesting self-fulfilling cycle there. But what it may mean is that you may be safe fees on private school and instead you are kind of bundling that into your property purchase, which hopefully can appreciate in value by getting into one of those. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And um, the the suburb I'm referring to here, for those that know WA, is, is Shenton Park. So it's it's considered a yeah, a very good public school, and it is generally accepted that yeah, you move into Shenton Park so you can, you can get your kids to go to that school. But like you said, <laughs> self fulfilling, right? So it's attracting sort of yeah the higher income earners, you know, maybe mm -hmm. the more educated or they're in those higher roles, so they've got more money. They come in, you know, purchase. Or they've got that liquidity then to pay more for those assets, which then rises the prices. And like you said before, like, um, you know, the the school may or may not have an impact uh, in terms of performance, but a lot of it is the, the the child's entire environment. So what's going on at home, those socioeconomic factors as well, obviously play a big part in terms of that that child's overall performance and where they end up in life too. Mm. And there's a lot of research has gone into that aspect of it is that when we say socioeconomic it doesn't necessarily mean that the parents at home have a lot of money it could also mean that they have a good network a good connection of people around them so the you know the the girl that your daughter goes to school with and their friends their parents are the ceo or something like that and they're picking them up from school uh, and dropping them off because you can't get there that day and it exposes them to different things because they're kind of in that orbit there was um there are some things that people should research that i came across one of those things was that if you do decide to send your kids to whatever school whatever it may be there are some incentives or there may be some ex incentives that exist in your state for extracurricular activities i know a very modest program just to give you a very very like modest example of this you can get a voucher from the new south wales government if you google active and creative kids uh, and basically what it means is that uh, families who receive a, the family tax benefit part a or part b um, you can receive a very small voucher like 50 dollars per child to send them to a music lesson also to send them to sports or something like that it's pretty modest to be honest but there are other incentives that may apply and i know some of the catholic schools also apply some things like that for special access and these types of things so it's not all or nothing necessarily. You may be able to find some creative ways to get your child to get the benefits that you want them to have without forking out the full price. That's right. Or you potentially um, take more of the method of, you know, I'm going to send them to the public school and with some of those savings that I'm going to make, then I'm going mm -hmm. to invest in these extracurricular activities for my child. So I'm going to get them extra tutoring or, you know, music lessons or send them to, you know, some sort of PT or sport professional or something like that, which mm. is stuff that obviously at these sort of higher um, sort of top private schools is generally sort of included in the, the package per se that you get as part of your tuition. True. Yeah. And we'll bring up some data on this in a minute. We've got a bit of an Excel spreadsheet that people can jump into. Um, one of the things about moving into those catchment areas is that you, depending on how it works, you may be able to rent in that suburb if you can't afford to buy 
So go and have a look, tour the school, find out what the rules are, and you may be able to move to that suburb as a renter in advance. Um, and this is a this is a strategy one of my family members is looking to pursue to rent in that suburb. It's just the suburb across. It's about three streets across, but you go into that suburb, and the the house price difference would be three or four hundred thousand dollars versus this side of the fence, which is quite wild when you think about it. They're still going to the same supermarkets, the same sporting grounds you know, the same access to the same train station, but literally just over there is the catchment area where the school is going to accept you. And this side is a bit different. So they may be thinking of doing the, the renting route instead of selling up and moving across. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Now, I've got a bit of data to share with people for those people that are interested in going to private school, but maybe Alex, I think the, peop- the thing that people would really want to know is if they are convinced that private school is something for them. Can you give us some ways or methods or strategies that you can think of and that you use with your clients at Everest that it can help ease that burden or it can help give them a plan or some direction? Can you give us some of those? Of course, yeah, 100%. So like I said, um, when you know when clients come to see us, it's, it's one of the questions that we ask if, if they have young kids or they're planning on having um, you know kids in, in sort of in the future because like all things, the earlier you can sort of start, generally the easier it is. What we will do then is drill down to like, okay, well, do you have a specific school in mind or a couple of schools in mind? And then generally, uh, so then we know the fees, right? Because as we sort of mm-hmm. established today, um, you know, there's, there can be quite a, a range in cost. You know, I think you mentioned your school's currently six and a half grand if you were to go today. Mm-hmm. And we've, we've talked about schools which charge 30, 40 grand um, as well. So a massive sort of difference uh, in cost there. So that's really important to you know, if you are thinking private school, have a bit of a think about the specific one or specific ones you're going to to send you your your child to, because what we'll often do then with with that is we'll we'll index the fees going forward. Because yeah. I think you said when you went there it was it was two grand or three grand or something yeah. like that, and now it's basically double, right? Um, so it's important to apply some indexing to that. So we'll we'll do that, and then it just kind of depends. Then I guess then as we get more specific, it's okay. Well, are you thinking primary school and high school? Because it can be quite common. I've seen that they'll do the local public primary school maybe because they're happy yep. with, with that and then they want to go to, to uh, a private high school as an example or they want to go private the whole way through. So that again will affect how much sort of resources or funds we need for that too. And it will also affect then the strategy somewhat. So coming back right. to the time frame. So if the child's only just born and they're thinking um, high school is, is, is all we sort of want and this is the, the private high school we're going to pick, well, we've got quite a long investment time frame in that case because you don't go until you're 12. So then it may make sense to invest some of that money now um, to get a better return as opposed to just to sort of parking and savings because it's going to be quite a long mm-hmm. time before we need to access it versus, okay, they're four years old and they're starting prep next year, um, okay, then, you know, investing that money is going to be quite risky because if we have a downturn in the market over that time and we need to sort of pull that back out, we're potentially in a worse position than what we started. And then anything in between. So for clients that are doing primary school and high school, we might do a combination of savings and investing. So effectively, it's like, okay, up until say years five, we're pulling from savings, but then past that point, there should be enough money in the investment based on our calculations of you know, relatively conservative returns. Again, indexing against the school's fees and capital gains and stuff like that, factoring all that in, uh, we should be able to pull that out. Mm. And then basically, we only have to tip in maybe five grand a year going forward or, or no money possibly as well, because now the investment is effectively big enough that that will pay for the kids schooling right until they sort of turn 18. Interesting. How about things like, and we haven't really talked about these that much on the show, but some people will have come across marketing or just their financial advisor may have mentioned it, which are things called education bonds. Um, Like what about them as a, as a vehicle for supporting educational costs? Yeah. So that's a really good point. So uh, we'll touch on that, but I think it comes back to first when you're doing any investing, the first thing we always think about is the tax structure we're going to put that in. Okay. Right. And, and, and a bond is, is a tax structure. So your own personal name is a tax structure. You and I could do an investment together. So um, a joint sort of individual there, that's a different structure. Companies a structure, a trust is a structure, a super fund is a structure. And these are examples of different tax structures. And effectively, the difference between them, generally speaking, is the tax rate they pay mm. and then the flexibility. So how easy is it to get money in? How easy is it to get money out? 
And generally speaking, the more inflexible the structure, the better the tax rate. So that's yeah. the thing about super. You know, we can only put in twenty seven and a half thousand right now of concessional contributions. That's going up to thirty next year. You can't put in heaps and heaps, right? And then you can't have that money back until you mm. obviously meet a condition of release. The main one obviously being old enough to um to be to be uh, you know of retirement age. So very tricky, right? But it only it pays a very low tax rate. Whereas, you know, your own name, generally you'll pay the sort of the higher tax rate, but once you receive your money, you know, you can do right. There's no sort of uh, restrictions there. So yeah. at, an education bond or sometimes, um, which is similar to an investment bond in terms of the, the structure, sort of sits somewhere in the middle, right? So it effectively pays the, the corporate um, company tax rate, okay, of, of, of 30% there. Um, and it, it, can, it can be a good strategy for if you, say, have two people that are on higher incomes, which, again, generally they may need to be if, you, if you're thinking about mm-hmm. sending um, you know, your kid to one of these schools, which costs sort of 30 30 to 40 grand. Um, and there can be a lot of benefits for, again, starting that early because effectively once you sort of hit past the 10 year mark, there can be some, so there can be some additional sort of tax advantages with that as well. So you, you may sort of cap um, paying a lower tax rate along the journey and then post that sort of 10 year mark, they can be um, quite attractive as well. It again, though, depends on what you're doing. Um, so we so for, for university fees they can be quite good so one thing we obviously haven't touched on yet is mm. we're just talking about private school but maybe you're going to do public um primary and high school and then you you might pay for your, for your child's university obviously that's that cost keeps going up as well um so that's that's another area where um yeah an education bond can be can be quite useful but yeah, you do have to be careful with them and appropriate planning really is needed because it is kind of like a minimum sort of 10 year kind of time frame you're generally looking at. Bonds in general, you can invest in the same things that you know that, that you and I can sort of invest on, but there will obviously be an additional sort of admin fee within that as well. So you kind of mm. need to consider that too um, when you when you're looking that at that as well. Yeah, they're quite um complicated, particularly the education bonds, uh, in terms of like setting them up, sticking to the rules, and then how you use the proceeds. I think you've got to get expert advice on those types of things. Um, and if I can just add to that too, like depending on the product you go for as well, um, because some products within bonds, right, well, sorry, education bonds, will allow you to uh, pull out your capital and not touch your earnings. Whereas other ones, when you pull money out, it's a comp- it's like pro rata, it's a combination of capital and earnings. Interesting. So where that can be, again, we're getting into the weeds a fair bit here, right? But like, you know, say you've been putting in 10 grand a year going forward and then you want to, you need 10 grand back, right? Well, mm. if, if it's a product which allows us to distinguish between what you've put in and what it's earned, we could just pull from that capital pile. Then there's no actual tax to pay on that, right? Because you've already paid the tax on that. Yeah. But again, that's that's sort of important to do your research on yeah, not just education bonds, but like what specific education bond because there is a little bit of difference between the providers as well in terms of whether they have that ability or not, as an example too. That's a really good point. So if you've got some near term expenses we're saying, that savings account or an offset account, if you've got a mortgage, I'd imagine you'd say the same thing. If it's a longer term thing, maybe like high school, you should be investing the money in some way to earn a good return so you can kind of match that future payment because the cost of schooling is going up from today as well. Um, You mentioned that my school had doubled in price. I'm not that old despite what I look like. So um, so so that's in a pretty short period of time. Um, And then the other one was like you can explore education bonds, but be careful with what you do and how you do it and speak to... um, your financial advisor. It is a very important topic to get financial advice on generally anyway. Um, and the early, the earlier you start, in all honesty, that again, I know I've said this a few times, but that, that really does make a difference. You know, I had some clients come in the other day and they want to go to quite a high or quite a, quite an expensive private school, sort of around that 25 to 30 mm-hmm. mark um, over in, in Victoria, actually. And they, their kids are exactly about it. They, they were sort of like eight and 10, so they're, they're pretty close. Um, and they're, they're obviously good mm-hmm. good income earners and we're going to be able to achieve it, but they are going to have to obviously pump a fair bit of money pretty quickly to get this thing going. Whereas, you know, had we started sort of five years earlier, in terms of the cash flow hit, it would have been a lot lower. Yeah, for sure. The other option is um, 
to kind of think about creative ways to maybe move to the suburb to capture that good uh, public school that you're looking at. And there's probably a fifth one here, which is just keep like investing yourself as in investing for your own financial benefit. So then you can provide this to your kids or grandkids in the future, um, which is an obvious one that we would encourage everyone to do is just improve your own financial situation, generally speaking. Um, go for it, mate. And I was just going to say, like, you know, we've obviously just really talked about public versus private here. The other, I guess, sort of school of thought is, you know, like the school of life. So it's like, okay, we're not going to do the private mm -hmm. school, but we're going to take that 15 or 20 grand a year and we're going to go to Europe and we're going to go to America and we're going to go over to India um, and give, you know, our kids sort of those sorts of experiences um, because then we're not having to spend our resources on private school. So I think that's worthwhile considering as well. And I think, like, as you said at the, at the top of the show, there's, there's no right or wrong way of doing mm. this. It's, it's, I think it's important to really think about what your values are and what you want and discuss that you know, with your partner and, and make a decision from there. But yeah, there are a lot of different ways um, that you can mm. do it. I might um, come back to you on that in just a moment. I'm going to share for anyone that's watching this on YouTube, hello, and um, just quickly show you a spreadsheet. You should be able to get access to this. It's not perfect. It's just something to get, we whipped together this afternoon. But basically it shows the average cost of schooling uh, at the top, we've got an investment return and education inflation rate, your mortgage rate, and the number of kids. So if we assume two kids, um, basically from years one to 12, assuming the inflation rate and assuming that the school's prices stay the same, for, for a child, you're going to spend about 100 to 110000 on a single uh, child going to government schooling. For Catholic, you're going to spend about 240000 For private, about 380000 That's in the dollars in which you'll incur the costs. Um, I think one of the things that you just mentioned is basically probably the, the most important thing to consider as a strategy is the school of life strategy. And the way I'd probably quantify that in a spreadsheet is if you don't send your kids to a Catholic or to a private school, and instead you use that money for your own financial benefit to provide for them or to invest for them in whatever way you see fit. Uh, and I just run some pretty, pretty, some quite primitive numbers Assuming that you were going to send kids to private school or to Catholic school, what would be the value of that expense in today's dollars? And instead of spending that on the school, you take that money today and you invest it in something that produces a decent return after tax. And you can jump into the spreadsheet and have a look, but basically it's this send to private, uh, send to public uh, and invest the money instead. Uh, and at the end of the 12, uh, 12 years of schooling for a single child, instead of going to public school, um, you might have, um, sorry, instead of going to private school, you might have $450,000. Uh, and if you did it, uh, avoided a Catholic school and said invested that money, it might be $214,000. And so the way I think about it, and this is maybe just too rational and not emotional enough, um, Alex, is just, I think to myself about what was so great about my schooling and how my upbringing, and it wasn't actually, now that I think about it, my school was good and I would happily send my kids there. I don't know if I'm going to, by the way, I think I'm, we are opting to send them to a, a public school, but I was trying to think about like what it was. And it was kind of the sense of that you could achieve what you wanted to achieve in life. You can be the person that you want to be. You can be the man that you want to be. Um, and I don't think that while, while the school played a part in that, I don't think that was the, the predominant driver for that belief in my life. I think it was actually what I did with my parents, my home life and these types of things. And so I spent a lot of my time, you, you mentioned like school of life. I was trying to think about this. In my opinion, as I sit here today, I would much rather take the money that I would be spending on private schooling and invest that into them and invest that into our family unit, whether that means more school, more sporting events, like more sporting outside of school. Maybe it's tutoring. Maybe it's you know helping them be creative in life in whatever pursuit they might have. Um, I'm fortunate that I'm assuming that I'll be able to send my kids to a private school if I want to, but I don't think I'm going to because I think there's a better way for them to get more from life. Now that's just my opinion, um, and I'm kind of a contrarian by nature, <laughs> but. This is how I think about it. And I'm curious to know how you think about that. Yeah, I think, you know, you and I were having a little bit of a chat before we got started today and um, you know, relatively sort of similar-ish views. Um, myself, anecdotally, is I will most likely do the private school option. However, mm -hmm. it would be more of that Catholic school option, um, which is basically what, yep. what I went to. Uh, 
And the reason for that is just, well, one, like, like location as well. Um, yeah. There's some some really good Catholic schools where we are. Um, you know, that's obviously where I went. I, I had a, a pretty pretty good experience as well. The local sort of public school where we are too, like it's it's not bad by any sort of means, but um, I think there is, yeah, again, anecdotally, a few risks possibly of, of sending my kids there as an example versus that that Catholic school option. But back to your point before and talking, talking about, you know, private school and these costs, some of like the, the hidden costs per se is – you got to remember, particularly when you're going to some of these these more expensive ones, is people that send their kids there often will come from money to a degree, and often they're not paying for it all themselves either. Like the grandparents are often chipping in and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So if you don't have that inheritance um, coming to you, um, then that's going to make it more difficult, more financial pressure on yourself. And then also remember that who your kids are then potentially hanging out with, right? You know, those kids may be holidaying in France every sort of summer or or every winter or they're going skiing and stuff like that. And that may not be your reality because a lot of your resources are going to get into the school as well. So it's about think it's thinking about that right as well because, you know, Mm -hmm. in in sort of having those conversations too. Because I've I've had a few frank conversations with with clients over the years where, you know, they earn good money, but they don't their family does come from money or something like that. And they're almost you know, looking to sort of investing a lot of their wage into this private school. And then it's explaining, I guess, well, you know, there are going to be additional costs in this too. Like like you said, mm. you know, iPads or whatever else as well. But you are kind of going to be competing socially with those with those other families too. And and that might put your your child in a little bit of an awkward situation if you know they're sitting there at lunch in the court and everyone in the group is going to Europe for, for Christmas and you're not. <laughs> it's, <Yeah. laughs> it's something else I think to sort of to think about. Yeah. Plus, plus, plus the pros, obviously, of, of that network to have it. Yeah, absolutely. There are pros. And I've come across, and we've all had these anecdotal kind of things. We tried to keep this episode as kind of data-driven as possible and stick to the numbers and the academic research. But I anecdotally, I have had a lot of conversations with people who did go to those private schools who were on, parents were on good, you know, what we would say, maybe upper middle income wages. And they send them to this private school thinking that all right, this is the launch pad that my kids need. But frankly, they weren't, the kids weren't that way um, inclined. And so they really went through the ringer to put their kids through this school. And then it's probably an adverse outcome for some of them that I'm thinking about because, like you said, they really stretched to get to that private school. The, the parents were stressed a lot of the time financially to make that happen. And then they got there and the kids didn't get the full benefit of it because they weren't that way inclined. But also they're looking at these other students who do come from the kind of the the bigger amounts of wealth. And that's that's what I think about a lot in terms of how you how your your child perceives themselves is probably far more important than where they go to school. And so if you give them the confidence, you spend the time. I just think personally I would much rather the str- not have the stress of money. I know people that I think I look at them today, I think you're you've got such a good wage. You've got enough money. You're financially independent. And I ask them, why are you still working? And they say, well, oh, and I'm shit scared of not being able to afford my kids' schooling. And that's the reason why they stay in jobs for five or 10 years. And I just think that's a missed opportunity for, for time spent. Massively. Like, you know, I had a client a number of years ago that you know, he was earning about 150 grand. So, you know, by no means a small wage or anything like that. Um, his wife couldn't work for sort of medical reasons and um, she had come from a relatively wealthy background. So she went to sort of these uh, sort of um, private schools originally and then sadly um, her family had lost a lot of money in the GFC and never sort of mm. recovered. However, that was sort of her upbringing. So it was very important to her. Whereas, um, you know, for himself, he was more of a, a country boy, didn't really come from money or whatever else. But they both just believed in private school so strongly, even in me, you know, sort of sitting there being like, you know, basically three quarters of your after-tax wages, because they had three kids, by the way, in, in oh. these private schools. Um, wow. So it's like close to $90,000 or something in, in tuition. Um, so like almost his entire after-tax wage was going to, to private schooling. And they, they have pursued with that. And obviously, you know, um, best of luck to them and, and whatever else. But yeah, to me, that's that's too extreme. And like you said, the the data supports that as well. That there's there isn't any really material performance difference between a public schooling versus a, a public a private schooling system. Yeah, and, and it's a tricky one as well. I'm mm-hmm. rambling a little bit here, but like, no, it's fair. Yeah, I, yeah, anecdotally, like 
I agree. Like those private schools, like if your if your kid is particularly gifted at music or sport or, or something like that, then the tools and the resources there are to really hone that. But if they are more average, like you know, like myself, <laughs> like and, me. Like, and like most people, then you just don't see that uplift in performance, right? It's it's just you just end up paying an extra twenty grand that you know a year that you don't necessarily have to. And, and so much is down to to luck as well, like of just the other kids in that school year. You know, you always hear about oh that was mm. a that was a bad year, so you know you can just get unlucky that the other kids that, that end up going in that year to whatever school it is. Um, actually yeah. have a massive impact, I think, materially as well on how your kid, yeah, like I said, perceives themselves, how they perform, those sorts of things as well. Absolutely. You see that in the school scoring under the ATAR system now. You can see the schools vary from year to year and quite dramatically sometimes. Um, well, mate, normally when we end these shows, uh, I do ask for one thing that um, – you want to leave listeners with um, today, obviously we're talking about schooling or uh, education more generally. So I might ask the, the question in a slightly different way. It's like, what's one thing that parents or grandparents could maybe focus on in the next two minutes of their life? Like what could they take away from this episode? What would you say to them? Yeah. I think the main thing they can, they can take away from, from today, hopefully is um, if you haven't sort of thought about where you're potentially going to, to send your kid to, to primary school and high school, Spend two minutes having a think about that, and then um, and and you know, and then do a little bit of planning around it. And you'll need to do a little bit more, I think, if it's private because of obviously the costs and stuff like that. But yeah, don't leave it to the point if you um, if you can avoid it until they're you know it's it's sort of a year out or something like that because then yeah, potentially mm. it may not be able to uh, come to fruition. Yeah, I love that. Start start now. Start early, uh, and it makes everything easier. Let your money do the heavy lifting if you are saving for kids' education. Well, Alex, this has been heaps of fun. People can get in contact with you at Everest. There is a link in the show notes if you do want to match with the financial plan. Otherwise, head to the Everest website uh, where you can find out more. Book a free call with the team. Mate, it's always a, always a pleasure to chat to you, so thanks for joining me. Thanks, mate. Good fun. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.